Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host, and I'm a filmmaker that's been working with CCF for almost a decade now. Can't believe it. It's been a wild, uh, fulfilling ride for us. And, and basically what I do with CCF is help them create video content to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. Sometimes that's in produced videos or video series, and sometimes it's in a live video series like Lunch with the Experts. So if you're new to the show, welcome. Let us know where you are in the world, where you're signing on from. We love to see the, the reach and how far uh, this program reaches. And if you're a regular, if you're a friend of the show, you know the drill. Let us know where you are. So before we get started, I want to thank Tercera Therapeutics for their support of, of the Lunch with the Experts series. If it weren't for them, we couldn't do this. But before we proceed, we just have a little disclaimer we like to say at the top of every program, and that's that the opinions of the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home have not been created or suggested by the spon uh, sponsors of the Facebook Live program. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health and treatments. Okay, so that lets a lot of words. Uh, you know how disclaimers can be. The point is that last sentence. That's the takeaway. We're going to give you some good general advice and direction and hopefully some information that helps you answer some of the questions you have, but we certainly don't know your specific case, and we certainly don't want you to make any decisions without talking to your home team who does know your case. Okay, so today's guest is Dr. Hagen Kennecke. How are you, Dr. Kennecke? I am great, thank you. It's uh, 9 a.m. on the West Coast here. Um, we've had a pretty rainy, our one of our top rainiest, warmest Januarys. We're hoping it'll get a little bit wet, but so far we're meeting all the stereotypes of wet. wet. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting because uh, I'm based in North Carolina and the East Coast has had the same thing. We've had just a, a tad bit of snow, but it's been so wet the past couple of months. Literally, the ground is, is saturated. I'm looking at how muddy it is right now. So yeah. we do share that in common. Tell the folks out there a little bit about you know, what you do, how you serve the net community, where you work and, and, and in what capacity. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I love uh, Absolutely. the neuroendocrine tumor community, as well as uh, carcinoid, CCF, Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, does uh, great service for, for patients and providers and keeping us together. I'm a medical oncologist uh, here at the Virginia Mason Cancer Institute in Seattle. I will uh, say that I will be relocating soon to the Portland Providence Cancer Institute in uh, Portland, of course. Uh, that will happen in March of 2021. Um, here at Virginia Mason uh, in Seattle, I uh, treat a, a large uh, a neuroendocrine tumor patient population. We were the uh, first program in the Northwest to uh, to start uh, PRT therapy. Uh, we're the largest uh, among the largest programs in the U.S. at this time. Uh, I love uh, the uh, the rewarding aspects of taking care of, of patients with neuroendocrine tumor malignancies. The, you know, lots of challenges, lots of areas mm -hmm. that we can do better. Um, I also uh, treat patients with colorectal cancer malignancies. So there's a quite a bit of overlap there sometimes because we know that a lot of these tumors can arise in the large bowel. Most of them arise in the small bowel and, and pancreas, but can be also large bowel. So, so that's my other passion uh, uh, is, uh, is, is those types of malignancies. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you. You know, one thing that you said that stuck out to me uh, and, and always does, it's so true, is you, you mentioned the, the community, the neuroendocrine tumor community, and it is such a community it, it, that is so accurate and it exists here at the show. You see it within the comments. You can't see it, but I can. But I always like to read through and I'll, I'll let you know some of the comments we see. But what happens typically in the show is you have these conversations going on, people sharing their stories or their experiences uh, as we're talking about these topics. And from the support groups to the, you know, almost every, every medical expert I've met in this disease really has a passion for their patients and, and this disease. And so um, I think that's one of the, the, the greatest things about this community and a big part of what we try to provi provide with the show, information and then that element of community. Totally. So 
Yeah, I love that you called that out already. I couldn't couldn't agree more. Uh, speaking of our community, we got a lot of people from the West Coast today. Sunny Los Angeles, San Diego, Washington, Washington. Looks like you have a little pool on the on the on the West yeah, Coast hey, there, Doctor Kennedy. Yeah, it's a great community here. There's a Pacific Northwest carcinoid uh, group here, and they're very active. And uh, I've had lots of uh, the privilege of working with many of them uh, professionally as well as uh, you know their 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 group and speaking to the group uh, on uh, on a couple of occasions it's, a, it's been a little bit different during the uh, the covid times but it actually makes it almost easier doesn't it yeah with that virtual presentation in ways for sure absolutely i mean uh, i know it's been uh, in ways more efficient for for medical uh, providers to, to, to help patients with telehealth and same with us. This program is one of the, one of the unexpected benefits of the pandemic is that we've been able to reach so many more people, by the way, Ellen Dunn, a friend of the foundation says, good morning, rain. Good morning to my doctor. He's been hey, so <laughs> Ellen, uh, Ellen is, is definitely a good friend of mine too. Okay, everybody. So, um, if you are new to the show, go ahead and send in your questions. We already told you that Dr. Kennecke uh, can't really help you with very case specific questions. So try to ask your questions in a general way, and we'll try to give you general advice. Uh, if you do have follow up questions, because, you know, with respect to our guest time, as well as yours, we may not get to all the questions. Some We rarely do, I'd say, because we get a lot of questions, which is a good problem. Uh, but if you have follow-up questions, reach out to Carstone Cancer Foundation, either here on the Facebook page, you can send them a private message or visit their website at carstenoid.org. We will try to get to all the questions. We'll definitely try our best. One thing that you can do to help me, which you guys have been doing an awesome job of uh, recently, is if you see a question in, in the comments bar, that you also have, or you'd also like the uh, the answer to, or you're interested in, you can like that question or, or love it. There's a lot of different emojis you can choose. But if you do that, I see that, hey, there's a demand for that question. It kind of upvotes it and it allows me to, to, to make sure that I get that question across because multiple people have it. So that's a little tip that kind of helps me do my job better, which is to serve you. So it helps you. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to say, have you downloaded CCF's Net Cancer Health Storylines app. This app makes it very easy to record your symptoms, medications, nutritional concerns, your moods, and everything else. So if you haven't, check it out. We will put that link uh, in the comments. And anything Dr. Kennecke mentions today, a resource, an article, a, a medication, anything like that, uh, we'll try to include links in the comments as well so that you can click those. You don't have to go to Google and start searching for those. We want you to be here in this interactive uh, session that we have today. That being said, before we get started, if you know someone else who would benefit from this show and having this kind of virtual one-on-one -on -one experience, go ahead and tag them in the comments or share the video to their page. We want to get as many people here as possible. Uh, all right. So um, I have a couple of questions before we get started. Everybody else, go ahead and start asking your questions. Dr. Kennecke, I'm curious how many if you could put a percentage to it, how many of your patients are neuroendocrine tumor patients? At this time, it's 70%. 70, wow. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, you know, I, one of the things that we know is uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, many of them are, are cured, but still need a long-term follow-up because the, the, the surveillance is important out to years 10 and beyond. And then of course, your patients with with more advanced tumors, uh, they do very very well as well. Many many of the times, and and so there's what we call in the medical field a high prevalence of the disease. Even though uh, it's a rare tumor, uh, there's uh, people live very long with it, and so the disease is a lot more prevalent than it is incident. How long would you say you've been working with net patients? That at, for 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a, a little experience with it. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. I've had some great opportunities to do uh, additional training. I did a sabbatical uh, uh, in Sweden. Okay. And, and uh, with uh, Dr. Kyle Oberg. Sure, I figured figured that's yeah. where you're going with that. And his team, uh, there's, there's more than one. And that's really when I first became exposed to PRT mm -hmm. in Canada, um, just like in the US, it wasn't very available. And so we were uh, sending our patients to Germany and Sweden. And so I, at one point, decided to go there, like see what it was all about. 
and saw a patient getting PRT and that I had seen you know, a month before in clinic. And it, uh, it was a beautiful area and very uh, just benefited from their, their understanding of, of these tumors and mm -hmm. when to treat and how to treat. And, and they, they treat much different than we do. Mm -hmm. We are restricted in the US by you know, the, the rules and, yep. and in terms of dose, in terms of how often they, uh, we can give the therapy and uh, so that is going to change, I do believe, uh, but, and it's, it's going to change because of the knowledge and experience from the other centers throughout the world. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I know it's been such a game changer for, for uh, U.S. patients since 2018 when it was became right. uh, allowed here. And, and before that, I remember a lot of the patients that we told the stories of, you know, having to travel for that. And it, yeah. that's a lot. That's another burden for them, you know, when you're trying to to fight something like this, to have to like go seek out a treatment in another country on another continent when, when it could be available here. So I'm really glad they did that. And it's good to hear that, um, that you feel that, you know, some of those barriers or restrictions will be, be lifted soon. I agree. The more, you know, the more people know about it, the more knowledge that's spread. Um, speaking of PRRT, we already got a great question that came in about that. So I'm going to um, go ahead and pivot to some audience questions. So Denny says, greetings, Dr. K. Yesterday, a, PR, a PRRT nurse in Los Angeles stated that if a PRRT patient has completed the initial four cycles of treatment uh, and then has had uh, and then has at least 12 months progression free of disease, they would qualify with insurance coverage for two additional cycles of PRT if and when their disease did progress. Do you, is this true as far as you know? That is medically correct. Okay. There was recently a meta-analysis looking at all the patients that um, have been published, their patient experience that have been published that have uh, been retreated. It's called PRRT retreatment. And there was a total of 440 of them and talked about how they did with retreatment. Mm -hmm. And the majority uh, responded again, and uh, the toxicity was very low, and there was no increased risk in getting, for example, the feared myelodysplastic leukemia kind of complications. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really, that experience, again, comes from outside of the US. And we know when we used to refer to, to Europe and uh, specifically Rotterdam, uh, where really they have the most experience with the retreatment, their rule was 18 months. So okay. if your disease was stable um, and uh, your tumor benefited from the PRT for 18 months or more. And that 18 months is measured from the first day of your first PRT ever. Then it makes sense. And there's evidence to suggest that it's reasonable uh, that there's uh, to do it again. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I know there's still a lot of information or a lot of questions around PRT that we're that we're trying to to answer, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's one of the one of the big ones. Uh, so moving on, we have a question from Alan, which it seems like a lot of people also have a uh, question on the COVID vaccine. This comes up every week, um, and possible negatives for patients of on Lanreotide specifically. Any conflict there? Not that we know of. I mean, I tell my patients. Get the COVID vaccines where you can and when you can. Uh, it's still hard to get. And mm -hmm. we know that this pandemic has changed our lives in so many ways. And it, we want to minimize the damage from it and you know, try to get back to normal. In terms of you know, medical risks, we looked at uh, patients with uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors that d uh, developed uh, carcinoid, uh, sorry, that developed the COVID. We haven't found any different experience. Uh, the vast majority uh, recovered. Um, so, you know, that no signals there that, that this, that the carcinoid syndrome would, would cause you to behave differently when it comes to the COVID infection. Uh, we're working closely with CCC19, which is the uh, COVID Cancer Consortium, uh, which is a, a national database, international database right now, actually looking at uh, all patients with malignancy that are uh, uh, COVID positive. And we're looking at the, trying to 
interrogate that database for neuroendocrine tumor patient populations. But so far, uh, no, no signals that there's issues with uh, PRT and the uh, vaccines or lanreotide or triotide and otherwise. I think the question comes up, you know, what about everolimus? That's a popular or an important part of therapy. We know that suppresses the immune system and it also puts patients at a slightly increased risk of, of infection uh, uh, of, of any sort, including, including COVID. So I would say that if you're on everolimus, all the more important that you try to get a COVID vaccine to protect yourself uh, due to that risk. Got it. Got it. Thanks for that. And thanks, Alan, for your question. Um, and I noticed that um, you all are already doing this, but I like to encourage this to everybody at home. If if you're getting value out of this or if there's some information that you just learned that was helpful, you can also send a, the like button or the love button and, and let us know that that uh, you're getting that value that lets us know we're doing our job well. Um, next question from Karen. In most cases, do you find with lots of lesions in the liver, uh, does the liver become enlarged? So uh, that can happen. It, it depends on the size of the lesions predominantly. Uh, it's remarkable. Some people can have, you know, extensive spots in the liver and you, you can't feel it. Uh, and in other cases, we see really bulky symptoms that cause local discomfort. Uh, and then also if the tumor is functional, it can cause you know, the, an increase in the, in the carcinoid syndrome if the tumor is functional. And, and so those are the situations where we really look at is there a role for liver directed therapy, including surgery or otherwise, when things are when when the liver is bulky like that? Um, when the lesion are lesions are plentiful but small, mm -hmm. that's generally a, you know that's that's a, still generally a very treatable stage. And you know if they are gradually progressing, that's when we consider things like you know PRT. Uh, get treated the lesions while they're, while they're small. That is, you know, a big question as to in neuroendocrine tumor care in general, when, when do you start treatment, right? Ideally, you know, you don't need any treatment and, and this thing kind of slumbers along. Um, but we're kind of realizing that you don't want to wait too long until the lesions are too big and bulky before you start the therapy, because then it's harder for the treatments to get to where they need to be, which is right in, in the cancer. The blood vessels aren't as good and the uh, circulation, the hydrostatic pressure in the tumor is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some advantages of, of, of uh, you know, starting a little bit earlier when you have that, that uh, tumor that's a little more bulky. Got it. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate it. Good to see you here. Uh, next question, Dr. Uh, Kennedy from uh, Gloria. Gloria says, does a CGA of 298, which is chromogranin A, yes, yeah. uh, does that all, always mean you have a carcinoid tumor? That may We may need more information on that one. I'll let you determine that, but yeah. maybe we just talk about the relationship between yeah, the Good question. That The chromogranin A is, is a you know, you, you love it and you hate it, and, and sometimes both. <laughs> uh, it uh, can really help us sometime find tumors when we're suspect suspecting them, and sometimes it can point to a direction in which uh, the tumor is going, uh, shrinking or growing. Mm -hmm. In terms of an absolute number, uh, it's not a great one. 293, no matter what the scale is, somewhere in the middle, and that's pretty much the level where it could be a tumor, but it could also be you know, medications. Uh, everyone knows about the proton pump inhibitors driving it up, but also renal, the slightly reduced renal function will drive up that chromogranin as well. So short answer is no, that would not be a diagnostic level uh, or test at that level. Got it, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Next question. Uh, from Tracy, is it possible for patients to be able to take their monthly octreotide injections without traveling to a cancer center? It's a five-hour process to get a shot due to, due to living in a rural area, uh, and this is a real burden when you consider all the time off for work for shots, scans, appointments. What are your thoughts on that? I'm sure she's not the only one uh, experiencing that. Definitely. So I'd say there's, there's three different options to give the, the shots. 
right? Uh, the Lanreotide particular is a little bit more flexible than the octreotide because you know the, when you the formulation of the agent is uh, is a little less finicky uh, with Lanreotide than octreotide, but both very uh, important, excellent therapies. In terms of how to give them, some patients do have a caregiver, loved one, give them. Uh, others uh, have the opportunity of having a travel nurse come to the house and give it. And the, there are company programs that pay for that travel nurse to do that. And then of course, the most common, unfortunately, is that you have to go into your doctor's office, doctor or oncologist. Most of that is, you know, the, whether it's at the home by a nurse or in the hospital is really, or clinic is really driven by insurance, isn't it? Uh, the insurance companies, many times, they will only pay for it if it's administered in a, in a hospital setting. And so they kind of force the issue. Don't ask me why that's the case, um, that that's, you know, we all know how uh, rigid some of those rules are. And that one is particularly rigid. You, you really, it's really based on the insurance. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, if, if your insurance plan has a, the flexibility and it, I think it's usually the privates that have a little bit more flexibility mm -hmm. than a home injection option is a good one and it's safe. Got it. Well, thank you. And, and hopefully that helps Tracy. I appreciate your question. Uh, from Dorothy, how many liver resections can I have? That is a great question for the liver surgeon. And look, it is remarkable what a, a good liver surgeon can do. We, I mean, I have seen situations where depending on how the liver is cut or and how many times, but more so as to how it's done, there, there's some portal hypertension that builds up. In other words, there's the blood that flow, is supposed to flow to the liver kind of backs up. And uh, so that is a, that's a, a limitation. It becomes a limitation. Now that we're using multidisciplinary tumor boards where you get the input from the uh, interventional radiologist and the surgeon and the med -onc and totally. the rad -onc, they can all say, hey, well, I can use this strategy versus no, I don't think you should use that strategy. And hey, I, why don't we you know, st try this approach? That's really where you're gonna get the best care and not excessive uh, surgery because there is more, you know, there's definitely is more than one way of, of uh, liver directed therapy. Got it. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I may be able to help you a little bit uh, as well, not because I'm a net expert, uh, but uh, this is a good time for us to let you know that uh, we also have produced videos, a uh, video series, a treatment based video series that we're releasing this year. And I think we did nine of them. And the final one is coming out very, very soon. We're in the final stages of post-production and it is on surgery. So specifically, we talk about that and we feature um, uh, a lot of the doctors that have been on the show. And so that's uh, that'll be almost a 15 to, to maybe 20 minute video all on surgery. So I will certainly let you all know when that's available, but within the next couple of weeks, it should be here. It'll be right on the videos tab. And we've got a lot more that we've, that we've produced this year on PRRT and carcinoid syndrome serotonin, uh, a lot of different uh, aspects and elements of, of the net uh, journey. So check those out. And when the surgery one comes out, check that one out as well. Um, if you are joining us, PTF has a great library of videos, just goes back for, for years, all kinds of familiar faces, but also, you know, data that I hadn't seen before yeah. in terms of, you know, opinions from, from uh, colleagues and, and mm -hmm. so you know, all over the world, really. Absolutely. So, great resource. Plus one to that. Uh, I love working with CCF and I have to say that they've really been on the cutting edge of, of technology and media, you know, from incorporating blogs and video for a long time ago. I've been working with them for 10 years. Um, and they certainly had videos before I came along of conferences of treatment based videos. We did a patient centric series, which was really successful. Um, and this, this is a perfect example of them pivoting in a pandemic to provide the content and achieve the mission they set out to achieve with using technological tools. So I'm glad you said that. I totally agree. And I think they've always been at the forefront of, of utilizing those different, uh, that different media to, to achieve that mission. So if you've joined us late or you're just joining us now, we are, this is Lunch with the Experts. We are here with Dr. Kenneke. We've talked about a lot of things. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about PRT today, and I know there's a lot of questions about that, but if you have questions about 
about that or anything else, send them in. If you know anyone else that should be here, we've got great numbers. You guys are a great audience today. Uh, anyone else that would benefit from this, go ahead and tag them. We've got about 30 minutes left, so we've got some time to get to your questions. So moving forward, we have a question from Dorothy. It says, can a slow-growing net metastasize and the new tumor become an aggressive tumor? Interesting. The short answer to that is yes, doesn't happen very much. Okay. But it is always something that we keep our eye out for and are aware of. If there's any doubt as to what you know a, a lesion is, it should be biopsied because you know it could also be another malignancy. Mm -hmm. And if it indeed is behaving you know so much differently than before, that's important information to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, biopsy is good, uh, uh, you know, doing a net spot, a uh, gallium 68 dotatate scan, uh, that it can be helpful as well to characterize it. Uh, so we're, you don't generally use a lot of circulating tumor DNA mm -hmm. uh, in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, but that is something that, you know, we, maybe we should start using uh, because, you know, assays like Natera, they are out there for any type of solid tumor. We heard about the net test, and so that can that can help define what these this new lesion may be. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a broader approach to understanding these tumors. What unique challenges would that bring about if the primary was was slow growing and and, and a metastasis was was an aggressive tumor? How would that complicate things for you in a different way? Well, it's all you know. It's all about the treatment, right? And okay. if it is more aggressive, then we need to make sure that we're treating it the right way. Always the first question we asked in neuroendocrine tumors is, you know, surgery, 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 can we cut it out? And if that's the case, then that's done. And if not, then we look at other options. But, and those other options, those are really the ones that are driven by understanding what kind of a tumor it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's, that's where that comes in. Got it. Uh, everybody at home listening, uh, Dr. Kennecke also just referenced the net test. This is another question we get every week because it's something new. And I think a lot of people are interested in it. Some people aren't, aren't sure about it because they don't have the experience. But just to let you know, our first episode of Lunch with the Experts way back in July 2020, which feels like a couple of years ago now, uh, was with Dr. Irvin Modlin, the creator of the net test. So if you do have that question, you're interested in it, go back and watch that episode. Just go to the videos tab, scroll on down to July 7th, July 9th, whatever the Thursday was. And there's a whole hour conversation about it with, with the guy, uh, one of the team who, who created it. So that's just a question that comes up a lot. So I'm sure other people uh, out there have it. Um, so Heather says, uh, Heather has a question. Uh, her tumor locations in her stomach, multiple type one, grade two, no somatostatin receptors. Her question is, are there any upcoming clinical trials or treatments that, that she should be looking out for? And I think that's a broad topic we can talk about. Uh, but are, are there any clinical trials coming around? Where can people find out about them? What, what's your thoughts on that? Thinking about, you know, the very early stage disease, which is what I, I think is it Heather is describing. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are looking at asking the question of what is the value of somatostatin analog therapy to prevent the growth of tumors in, in the creation of tumors, even in, particularly in patients with high-risk syndromes like MEN1 or otherwise. That's an experimental approach. I've used it once in a while uh, in patients that were at high risk of, of developing a, a net from a gen genomic perspective. In terms of, you know, for this particular situation, I'm not, I'm not aware of a clinical trial for gastric nets. Um, they would fall under, you know, in the more advanced setting, they would fall under the general gap nets kind of category, wouldn't they? So, so hopefully Heather will uh, find a, a study if and when she needs it for, for an indication. Um, but, um, you know, I think a lot of our focus is again on the prevention and then the, in, uh, uh, in the post resection uh, period. Uh, there's a study coming up for patients with resected pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors randomized to either chemo or not. That's uh, up and coming. A lot of the trials that are out there now are looking at PRT in rare 
kind of quote unquote rare uh, subpopulations uh, like lung uh, gnats, uh, like para, uh, paras and pheos. So that's, uh, and then of course, a small molecule therapy, uh, cabozantinib is being looked at, and uh, that's the uh, that's the trial that we're doing with Alliance on a national basis, the cabinet study. I've touched on a few, but definitely check out clinicaltrials.gov. That is a great search engine. You totally. really gotta know how to use it though, because a lot, a lot comes up. But it, it has it does. I, you, you know, yeah. uh, um, uh, Heather, the they have a map feature, like a map uh, way of, of of searching that that I found was kind of easier. So you can go to your state and you can whittle it down to region. Um, you know, that's that's one interesting way to do it. Obviously, you can search by topic as well. But I thought the map feature was kind of a little, maybe a little easier to navigate, um, depending on what you're looking for. But yeah, it's a great resource nonetheless. Um, so next question from Judith. In your new position, Dr. Kennecke, as a regional specialist, will you be offering therapy on a regional basis and what new PRRT changes uh, and or developments do you see coming? Yes, absolutely. We're, I will be bringing uh, PRRT and neuroendocrine tumor subspecialty therapy to uh, Portland Providence Cancer Institute. We have there a, a very large clinical trial program we are planning some trials. One of the ones you ask about PRT, we want to combine PRT with cabozantinib. And that will be a phase one trial. Uh, in what other studies are we looking at? Uh, what specifically changes for PRT? Uh, again, we talked about retreatment. I think that, you know, I think that's coming. And I think we may need to do a trial for that okay. sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. I think combination therapy in general for PRT, that's gonna be the topic of a retreat that is coming up for the Neuroendocrine Tumor Task Force of the NCI to uh, where the experts are getting together and asking the questions of, you know, how are we gonna design these studies uh, when it comes to PRT. Uh, pharma, our industry partners are really important in developing new treatments, of course. And we heard about uh, people like Del Passan talking about alpha emitters. Uh, that's coming. It is just in phase one right now. So it's not ready for prime time. We do need to work out the uh, toxicity issues, both short and long term with the alpha emitters. Uh, but that I believe will be definitely something we'll have as a treatment option in the future. What about how do you what about sequencing? Uh, in terms of PRT, where do you think, do you have an opinion on where you th that falls? I know that's a topic that there's been not controversy about, but people have different opinions or they're trying to figure out where that might fall in the, in the sequence of things or what, you know, what factors, you know, do you consider? Look, I think the number one factor is, is the patient factor when it comes to sequencing. Uh, you know, we know that most patients, if they need these treatments, they will eventually receive all of them and they will be able to receive all of them if they need them. So, and we don't have any evidence that using some treatments earlier versus later matters that much. Although we talked about a bit about, a bit about size mm -hmm. and if the tumors are really big, maybe PRT, maybe shrink them down a little first with some other treatment. Got so it. beyond that, the way I approach that is I talk to the patients and I, I got to tell you, most people that I present this to, mm -hmm. they, they kind of know what they want based on what they hear at groups like this, mm -hmm. as well as you know, what, their, what their doctor uh, informs them about and their team informs them about. Yeah, that, uh, I think that's so true and, and, and great. And, and I, that sentiment is shared with a lot of the doctors and experts that we have on, on the show. And uh, I'm not sure if that's just in the net community or if that's overall the way medicine is, is progressing. But I think, I think, uh, I mean, I like that approach, that yeah. patient centric approach. I think it's very important because the goals, the priorities of each person are unique. You know, their lifestyles are unique. And so I think yeah. they should be treated as such. So thanks. I appreciate that answer. Um, 
interesting question from Tanya. I'm on Lanreotide at 130 uh, milligrams and I've noticed more bone pain. Is that common? Can neuroendocrine affect the bones? And if so, what scan would be recommended? Ever heard of that? Uh, bone pain from Lanreotide I've not seen. Uh, okay. Although, you know, the symptoms that people experience with Lanreotide uh, never cease to amaze me. Again, most of the time it's well tolerated, but, you know, everyone has... A, uh, you know, that I've seen some pretty unusual reactions. I would want to rule out any, you know, pathology in the bone, uh, you know, METs or otherwise. Uh, CT is a really good way to look at any obvious structural issues related to a bone. Uh, and if you are suspecting a, uh, and want to rule out a, a metastasis or a tumor in the bone, the most sensitive way to do that is the gallium 68. Uh, Dota Tate scan. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, Mary says, hello from Cork, Ireland. Hey, Mary, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Um, any new information? There's a few people that, that also had this question and were curious about this. Any new information for lung neuroendocrine tumor patients who have carcinoid syndrome? Actually, and I've heard this question on some other episodes. What are your, what are your thoughts? Do you have knowledge on that? The lung... Uh, functionally active tumors can be a challenge for sure. If and we really want to characterize what type, what type it is, or what what is the tumor secreting, mm -hmm. and then go from there in terms of how what the treatment approach should be. So uh, if uh, there's not really any lung specific type uh, treatments, it's really all about the the chemical that that they are that's being secreted and that should be defined. You know, there are blood tests, you know, somatostatin level, uh, for example, but again, the lung ones can secrete more unusual um, uh, uh, factors. They, there could be more issues with hypercortisolism mm -hmm. that, that needs to be ruled out. And if indeed that's the case, then that needs close collaboration with an endocrinologist. And in general, I would always, uh, encourage involvement of an endocrinologist on the uh, on the uh, neuroendocrine team if there's if there's kind of endocrine type syndromes. Got it. Thank you. Okay, moving on. A question from Jim: Is it common with lanreotide injections with numer numerous numerous uh, liver lesions to have steady imaging on most areas, but a couple of lesions showing significant growth? And what is your opinion? Uh, what, in your opinion, rather, would be considered a large lesion where you would look to start PRRT? Generally, you know, we, we do see tumor heterogeneity in terms of, and, and we, we've actually looked at that at, at, at a molecular level, and that, you know, the old way of looking at cancers is that they're all clones of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but the new way is actually we understand that they are, they can differ, you know, they're like brothers and sisters and they can behave differently. In terms of when to start, it, you know, there's really not a size criteria. It's all about the velocity of change, the, the tempo of the growth. So if the tempo is significant, that is you know, a, that is a, a signal that, you know, some treatment is needed. Mm -hmm. and, and should that be PRT or can it be something liver directed? If everything is stable and there's only one lesion growing, we, you know, we would always take these, these, uh, this situation to our tumor board and ask the question, is there a way for like external beam radiation or Y90, focal Y90 to that one lobe or uh, another kind of ablative effect if it's just one area of uh, okay. progression. So, uh, get, get that one checked out, and and and, and uh, I hope that gets uh, that there's some good treatment options for that. Absolutely, thanks, Jim, for your question. Next question from Billy. This is a very uh, general question. Um, if all scans and tests after treatment show patient is NED, uh, no evidence of disease, when filling out medical questionnaires, how do you answer the yes or no question? Do you have cancer? Yikes, I feel like I need to be a lawyer to answer that question, but I would say that specifically for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we know that many are cured in this situation. I would answer the that with no. Okay, 
fair. Yeah, I've, I've, we haven't had that question before. That was, inter that was interesting, but fair point about, <laughs> about the lawyer. Uh, Margo says, hi, Dr. Kennecke. What makes a low grade um, over 10 years benign um, suddenly become aggressive and show up in the liver? So it, it, that is the mystery of cancer in general. Uh, we, I wish I knew. Uh, we, you know, I think our understanding of, of cancer is, is even though it's there and it seems to be static, it is always changing. And those changes are generally defined by mutations. Mm. And as they accumulate and change, that can trigger changes in the behavior of the tumor. That's pretty much our understanding overall of, of cancer in that it's an ever evolving thing. Uh, if it's there. If it's not there, then it's not evolving. But uh, we have to keep an eye out for, you know, that potential. And that's what the follow-up scans and, and, and so forth uh, are, are. That's what we do them for to rely on. Got it. Got it. Thank you. If you've joined us late, we are uh, this is uh, Lunch with the Experts with Dr. Kennecke, and we appreciate you being here. We've got about 15 minutes left to ask some questions, but I just want to let you all know that if you want to refer back to the video, it will be evergreen. It'll live here on the videos tab. You can always reference it, or you can send it to someone else later. And then starting Monday, we post them to YouTube for anyone that you know that doesn't have Facebook. They can also uh, access it there. So just as a reminder, interesting question from Fred. Fred says, I'm a 15-year male breast cancer survivor, and I'm currently being treated for carcinoid cancer. Have you found or know of any uh, mutual re relationship between the two cancers? The, uh, in, in short, I'm not familiar with a, an association between uh, genetically between breast cancer and carcinoid. However, your male breast cancer, you think about BRCA, uh, BRCA one and two, and we know that in that family, uh, BRCA, you know, although we think of, you know, ovarian and, and some other uh, malignancies like that, that travel with it, it, it and pancreas, it really could be a much broader area of, uh, of malignancies that are associated with the BRCA pathway. So if you haven't already been tested for BRCA, uh, yeah, make sure that that is done. I would recommend it. Got it. Thank you. And thanks Fred, for your question. Question from Donna, and seems a lot of other people. Uh, should we be concerned about having too many CT scans and radiation? Or where is that uh, level of concern? The short answer is yes, uh, but it is age dependent. And, and I'm not being ageist because you know, I'm not super young either, but uh, generally the rule is if you're less than age 40, that's when uh, the accumulation of exposure to radiation from imaging is an issue. And that's because the radiation of, uh, of scans are, are so small that it really needs quite a few and a quite a bit of time to develop the, the you know, subsequent cancers that you could get from mm -hmm. exposure to radiation. So basically, um, you know, you, it's a really, really long-term risk. And if you're over 40, that is essentially nil. Um, but all my patients that are less than age 40, I think of other ways, you know, we don't see lots of, you know, young individuals come with appendiceal cancers, uh, mm -hmm. neuroendocrine tumors, and they need imaging. I'll do uh, MRIs or every other year CT scans. And, and we think of uh, ways to minimize that risk for the young patients. Got it. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Moving along, got about 15, 15 minutes left, folks. Teresa says, I recently had a CT scan that showed two new spots that my oncologist uh, is identifying as cysts. I had a guy, I'm 68, in November uh, of last year that did not show these spots. How do you know for certain that the spots are cysts and not tumors? Um, I currently have two inoperable tumors in my liver and have had several several removed uh, surgically. I've also had Y90. Yeah, cysts versus tumors. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we And it's an important distinction because if something's a cyst, we are not worried about it. Mm -hmm. We know it's there and then we make sure it's not changing. Uh, but if something's a tumor that has other implications, the best way to know what anything is still is the old fashioned way of sticking a needle into it, 
that is, you know, has risks. And sometimes it's not always possible depending on where these are in the liver or elsewhere. So, you know, generally imaging can do a very, very good job of differentiating. You know, cysts are, they're fluid filled. They look completely different on, particularly on ultrasound. Ultrasound, I know it's an old fashioned tool, but it's really good for making the call is, is something a cyst or not? If you've also done a net spot, then you know that'll look at whether or not it's uh, you've got the somatostatin receptor, and that should really address the issue as well. Got it. So important to follow up on that, and, and good luck, Teresa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, question from from Karen: Should should we? And this comes up a lot as well. Should we get genetic testing done? That that is something that comes up a lot. And For sure. Yes. The. At, you know, we do, we do recommend it in some patients. And, okay. and you know, the, the long answer is for patients for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and a family history, that's when we start thinking about MEN1-2, uh, even von Hippel-Lindau. Uh, for the uh, carcinoid tumors of the small bowel and lung, those are much, much less and really no known role for genetic testing. I always ask for a family history. And in that family history, it's also really important to ask, you know, at what age did those uh, cancers develop, if any others developed in the family, and have a really low threshold to send to genetic counseling. Uh, you know, you mentioned this again, and I had a question from Donna asking about MEN1, and you had just mentioned it again. Uh, could you explain to the folks what, what exactly that is for those that aren't familiar? Right. So that is a, a known, what we call germline uh, mutation that affects risk of developing cancers. And it's a whole slew of cancers and also non-cancers, uh, high calcium, uh, so para, parathyroid tumors, uh, parotid uh, gland tumors can occur, and then a much higher risk of uh, these uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Really important for uh, screening and surveillance in this setting for all of those things, including high calcium, pituitary, because that can affect the vision. So that's what it, that's that's the syndrome, and you know a good genetic counselor will be, make sure to test for that as well as von Hippel Lindau. And they they have these panels that they that they use to make sure that you cover the whole spectrum of the genetic uh, risk that needs to be tested for. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you for, for, for laying that, that foundation down for us. A uh, question from Kathleen. It says, I've had, uh, uh, you know, net in the mid gut since 2015, been through PRT, uh, Lanreotide injections for many years, several net scans. Uh, I've been on everything. I recently developed edema in, in, in my, in both my legs. Do many people get this? My net specialist is sending me to a cardiac doctor for an echocardiogram. Um, if my heart is fine, what else could cause the terrible pain from the, from the edema? Um, I have seen that in, in some situations and I, I'm sorry, you, uh, is it Kathy, uh, you're experiencing that. Uh, so I think the, the look at the, the heart is, is really important. In some cases, we know that uh, if there's a lot of lymph nodes that build up, uh, those lymph nodes can press on the blood vessels that are supposed to bring the blood back from the legs to the heart. And that can cause some swelling of the legs. And in which case, you know, elevation, uh, diuretics uh, to get rid of that extra water. I know I'm not supposed to give any medical advice. So I'm gonna stop there, but I know that this is a hard uh, symptom sometime to manage and, uh, but there are options to treat it. Got it, got it, thank you. Do you remember the first time, this is a question for me, do you remember the first the first time you dealt with a patient? I know you've been doing this 20 years, but do you remember the first net patient that you that you saw? I do. And I met her and, and she had a functional tumor. Mm -hmm. she she had you know the the classic flushing as well as you know, the increased capillaries in, in the face. She, uh, I later also saw her in, in Sweden when she got treatment there. We have stayed in touch for many, many years. You know, what, what struck me about 
you know, the disease we're exposed to so much as, as trainees and even, you know, medical school and also oncology, what was the, you know, the understanding and the uniqueness of, of the disease with, yeah. with the neuroendocrine tumor. So that's, that's what I remember. Yeah. That, that's really what makes this uh, very meaningful for me. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was curious about that. If that's kind of what inspired you and what challenges were presented and if that's what inspired you to, to really ser serve that community, because there's always a story of, of, you know, when a, when a doctor first, first saw that patient, you know, they might've remembered it from medical school, but it's a different thing right. when, when that patient uh, is in front of you. Uh, a few minutes left folks. So I'm going to keep going with the questions. Terry says I'm on an Im immunotherapy trial. What's your opinion on that? This is also a question that comes up frequently about immunotherapy. Yeah. Immunotherapy been a great advance for many tumors, neuroendocrine tumors, kind of not that much. The, we know from this log a DART study that the aggressive, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors seem to uh, benefit from the CTLA and PDL1 therapy. Beyond that, neuroendocrine tumors, even of the pancreas that tend to have more mutations and, and can be more findable by the immune system, for the most part, we haven't seen a, a lot of success with those agents. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely worth continuing uh, to explore. I mean, we are just in the second generation of immunotherapy uh, and, and it's going to change. I, I think we'll find some something and some way to target these, uh, these nets with immunotherapy. There's many different targets we're looking at. There's vaccines, of course. And, you know, just like in melanoma, where, you know, we've seen signals in the past where the immune system plays a role in keeping them under control. There's, there is evidence that, you know, the immune system is keeping uh, carcinoid tumors uh, under control. So that, that really could lead to a, uh, a treatment at some point. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so, so glad to hear that you're participating in the study. Right on. A uh, question from Sean. Is it common for net tumors to be misidentified if the pathologists are not specifically looking for them or disregarding them due to lack of updated information? Definitely. Uh, and that is in both directions. Um, sometimes they're calling things neuroendocrine tumors and, and they're not because you're mm -hmm. doing you know special stains which point to a neuroendocrine tumor, but they're not necessarily neuroendocrine tumors because you have to consider the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're, they're missing it. That's happening a little bit less now as the awareness is greater, but we've all uh, seen and heard of stories where, uh, where you know, the wrong diagnosis was made or was missed. One thing I always do and encourage is second review of pathology. That has been shown consistently to change the diagnosis in about 15% of cases, not expensive to do. So what you do is, you know, when you're seeing your, a new uh, specialist, you just ask them to pull the old slides uh, and, um, and do the uh, second review. Yeah, many times they'll still be the pair of an embedded tumor tissue block and they can do extra stains on that in case they didn't mm -hmm. do CHI 67 or otherwise. You know, we started today's program, today's conversation talking about potential, uh, not changes, but, you know, improvements to PRT, um, other things that may help you do your job better, help, help neuroendocrine tumor patients. Um, what else are you looking forward to? Cause I know we've made such tremendous strides in the past 10 years has allowed us to diagnose a lot of more patients successfully instead of miss, you know, misidentifying them. What are some things coming up in the future that you think will be potential game changers, if that's too strong of a word, what's going to help you do your job better that you're, you're looking forward to in maybe the next handful to five years? Look, I mean, we talked a lot about the science and, but what we didn't talk about is, you know, the care and, and the aspects of, you know, the continuity of care. You know, I have had the privilege of being involved in a lot of patients care in, in Washington state and Idaho and Alaska. And one thing that's missing is a great, is a platform where we can all work on and to follow the imaging, to communicate, 
to store the pathology results, including mm -hmm. the ones that have been reviewed a couple of times. So we're still deal dealing with fax machines and, you know, you know, sometimes I get old slide, uh, old like films in a yellow envelope sent to me. This is like That's circa wild. day five. So what's the solution to that? There are some platforms that are, uh, that are supported by patient advocacy organizations mm -hmm. that encourage and allow patients to start creating their own virtual chart as opposed to starting uh, all over again. I don't know whether you know whether CCF has any initiatives like that or any of the other support groups, but I think that's that, that's missing because we really need to work as a team. And particularly now, I'm thinking about you know moving to to Portland and what's that going to look like? Am I going to have to you know, take all the paper? The patient's going to have to you know look uh, gather their medical records all over again. Um, anybody has any ideas? I'd love to hear about them. Absolutely. And a, a question I always like to end on first time patient or, or early patient, you know, diagnosed very recently, confused, never heard of this before. What advice would you give them to give themselves the best chance at, at, you know, good quality of life at a successful, you know, journey in their treatment of this disease when they're in that very first day when they've gotten that diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a daunting experience for anyone. Indeed. The look, I would say, take your time and you know, ask lots of questions, which this, you know, which I think we're getting better and better at. Totally. Uh, and uh, you know, rely on the right the right sources. You know, I've hear from some some patients that you know the the blogs and the chat groups are not that helpful. And I think we have to respect that. Not everyone, you know, finds, find, you know, everyone functions differently when it comes to, you know, getting information. So there's many different ways. There's, you know, videos, there's chat groups. And I, I do think it is important to be seen by, you know, someone who you are confident that they understand this very complicated disease. Totally. Absolutely. Uh, before we go, I just got a, a couple of comments. Uh, Karen says, we appreciate luncheon with the experts every week. And thank you to all the medical doctors. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy or Ken Kennedy, sorry, uh, for giving us your time. Thank you, Rain, even me uh, for hosting. I've learned so much. Uh, thank you, Karen. That's exactly what we're here for. Thanks, Dr. Karen. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a, a pleasure to host you. I appreciate your time so much. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Great seeing everyone. Absolutely. And thank you all at home for joining us. As always, we hope the program helped answer some of your questions. Please reach out to Carsonoid Cancer Foundation at carsonoid.org or here on their Facebook page if you have follow-up questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We absolutely could not do this series without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. Thanks for watching. I have been your host. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Bye-bye. Yeah.